Anticipation, Lord. 
Every time we look up at the sky, remind us, Lord, it might be today. We anticipate your return. We long for your appearing, as the scripture describes it. And we long, Lord, for you to be glorified in us, in your people here, in this place, in these specific people. Lord, glorify your great and awesome name in who we are, in our lives, in this local church. We pray the same for all around the world, for your people called by your name, called to walk in light instead of darkness. Let them shine brightly. Strengthen each and every one, Lord, for the glory of your name. Until your return, Lord, strengthen us all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Please be seated. Well, good morning, everyone. It's so good for us to gather together and to worship the Lord together. You know, when we gather for worship, we, we're so thankful for the opportunity that we have as a church to make much of our God. And that's what we seek to do in our worship services, to point all of our attention on God and make much of him, for he is such a great God. So thank you. Thank you for coming and singing and being a part of that. Um, yes, it is time for our kids to be dismissed for Kids Church. They're kind of ahead of me, uh, making their way out. And uh, so they can go ahead and exit through, uh, through that door in the back. And if you are new to fellowship and you've never done this before, please feel free to go in the back with your children and ask any one of our leaders that, that are back there. You'll see them with a fellowship church lanyard. And they are there to serve you in any way that they can. And we're just thankful for the opportunity that we have as a church to minister to kids and to children and for you as parents that give us that opportunity to do that. We, we really do appreciate it. It's something that we want to do uh, in a way that is glorifying to God. Also, our ushers are, um, have they already handed out our fellowship hats? Oh, okay, they're coming down. Um, and I just didn't know if I was behind you or ahead of you. But uh, our ushers will be handing out our fellowship pads, and we're asking if you receive one of those at the end of the aisle, if you could go ahead and pass that down through the entire aisle. And we really do appreciate you taking the time to sign those and uh, to let us know that you're here. It really helps us as pastors to uh, better shepherd the congregation, and we really want to do that well um, in the eyes of the Lord. So if you can do that, that helps us. If you're new to fellowship, welcome. We're so glad that you're here, and you can also uh, let us know that you're new by putting that on the fellowship pad. And also, again, if you are have the opportunity uh, in the back there, uh, just go to our guest services desk and let them know that you're new, and they will give you a very, very warm uh, welcome, and that's what we seek to do as a church. We just want everyone to know how thankful we are that you're here and that God has brought, uh, brought you to us. Also, this is a time uh, for us to recognize uh, how we continue to worship God through our giving, and uh, we're blessed uh, as a church. Uh, God has, has really blessed us, and, uh, and so we're thankful to God for that, and we're thankful to all of you who who give generously and sacrificially to the Lord's work. And uh, we just ask that you would continue to do that, that you would see everything that you have is coming from God, belonging to God. And if you call Fellowship Church home, that this is part of your worship to God, um, that you give and you give uh, in, in the name of the Lord and that you pray for us as leaders of the church, that we would use these gifts in a way that brings glory and honor to God. That's certainly our desire. And so these are the many ways that you have to give. And again, it is something uh, that we do with uh, joyful hearts, is what the scripture says, that we give gladly uh, to the Lord. And so we thank you very much for being a part of that. I'm going to take time to pray and just ask God's blessing um, upon uh, these gifts and our giving, that it may be acceptable uh, to the Lord. So would you pray with me? Lord God, thank you so much. For each of us, Lord, you have, you have blessed us in so many different ways. As we look at our own lives and we look at the, the different things that make us maybe distinct from others, Lord, we recognize that all that we have comes from you. Every talent, every skill, all of our resources and so, Lord, we're thankful that, that part of our worship of you, part of our recognition of God is the fact that we submit these things to you, our gifts, our talents, our resources. 
And Lord, we pray that you would help us as a church to use these, these gifts, uh, these tithes, these offerings in a way that brings glory and honor to you. Our desire as a church is to use them in a way that helps us to pervade the back mountain, the Wyoming Valley, and the world with the gospel by making disciples the kind that make other disciples and the kind that display the glory of Christ in every phase of their life. Help us to do that, Lord God. We cannot do it apart from you, but with you, all things are possible. We thank you in Jesus' holy name, amen. This is also a time for us to welcome some new members into the fellowship. So I'm gonna ask Bob and Leanne Wernis and also uh, Anne-Marie Sweats if you'd come forward um, at this time. And uh, we had the opportunity as pastors to sit down with, uh, with both Bob and Leanne and then also with Anne-Marie and hear their stories of how God has worked in their lives. They shared their testimonies of how they've committed their life to Christ, and then also their desire to join with us as a church, to join and be, become a part of our fellowship. And it really was, really was wonderful to hear their stories. And if you have not yet had an opportunity to get to know or meet uh, Bob and Leanne, um, definitely take time to do that. Introduce yourself today, hear their story, and the same with Anne Marie. Uh, it's just amazing to hear the way that God works in people's lives, how different it is, and the, and the stories of how uh, uh, that goes on in their life that brings them here. And so we're just thankful. And uh, so we want to welcome you into the church uh, fellowship, and we look forward to our church being a blessing to you. We want to help build you up and, and help you grow uh, in the grace and in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus. And also, we look forward to seeing how it is that God wants to use each of you to help serve him and also build up this body and edify this body. And I know, I know that's your desire as well. So we have some um, just certificates for you. And uh, I just want to pray and ask God's blessing uh, upon uh, this church and also on each of you and that God would bless uh, this union together, this relationship that we have together. And uh, I'm going to ask you congregation to join with me in that prayer. Lord God, we thank you so much for the church. It is, again, it's not man's idea. It is God's idea. And uh, Lord, you have put together a church and you've designed it in such a way that it, it consists of people who are broken and, and frail and need forgiveness and salvation, and yet you use us to accomplish your purposes. It's, it's amazing. And we thank you for, for that wonderful plan, and we thank you for working in Anne Marie's life in such a special way and her desire to serve you, and the way that you've worked in Bob and Leanne's life and their desire to serve you and so, Lord God, we just pray that you would bless them and also, Lord, help us as a church family to, to edify them, to build them up, to encourage them. Lord, we ask your blessing upon um, this relationship that we have, the church uh, to, to the member and the member to the church. May it bring glory to you, Lord God, in all, because that is our desire. So again, we thank you. For this opportunity. We look forward to seeing how you will use um, the, the people that you bring to us in, in a way uh, to glorify you, to honor you, and to make you known. So we ask you to do that, Lord God, and we follow you in faith. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God's at work in his people. He's at work in his church. We're thankful for that, and we're thankful that God doesn't leave us alone. But God very much promises to be present with us in all we do and say through the presence of his Holy Spirit. So let's thank the Lord for that. We stand together and remember our Savior and thank him for the work that he's doing and continuing. Just lamb of God. 
rescuing us from our sin and giving us a firm place to stand to walk with you. Jesus, my Redeemer, name above all names, precious Lamb of God, Messiah, all for sin. Today's scripture reading is going to be in John chapter 13, verses 1 through 15. Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart out of this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. During supper, when the devil had already put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to, de- to betray him, Jesus knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come from God who was going back to God. He rose from supper. He laid aside his outer garments and taking a towel, tied it around his waist. Then he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel wrapped around him. He came to Simon Peter who said to him, Lord, do you wash my feet? Jesus answered him, What I am doing, you do not understand now, but afterward, you will understand. And Peter said to him, you shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered him, if I do not wash you, you have no share with me. So Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but my hands and my head. Jesus said to him, the one who has bathed does not need to wash except for his feet but is completely clean, and you are clean, but not every one of you. For he knew who was to betray him. That is why he said, not all of you are clean. When he had washed their feet 
and put on his outer garments and resumed his place, he said to them, do you understand what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for so I am. If then your teacher and Lord have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you should also do as I have done to you. Well, good morning, and let me just again welcome any guests that are with us today. We are so glad to have you uh, with us uh, for our worship service, and uh, we're, we're excited to be able to be in such a warm room. We thank you, God, for providing this warm worship center to us on a single-digit uh, temperature day. We are now going to move into the time where we look into God's Word. Uh, as a church, we value the study and the teaching of God's Word. This book, whether you have a physical, physical copy, whether you're looking on your phone or you're looking on the screen, it is God's Word. It is living and active. It is authoritative, and it has the power to change lives. And so as we look into God's Word today, we, uh, we seek uh, to understand it so that it can change our lives as God intends it to. In the past couple of weeks, we've been looking at uh, our vision as a church, we're in a series right now where we're looking at worshiping, growing, and serving, and just exploring uh, those three words and how uh, the, the Bible is the foundation for that vision. Pastor Mark began the series two weeks ago with the sermon, Why Church? And last week, Pastor Carl preached with Why Discipleship? And you can find those sermons on our website, fellowshipefc.org. And today, we're going to continue that series by asking the question, why serve? So let's pray, and then we'll get into God's word. God, we thank you for your word, for the truths contained within it. We thank you that you have given us this word to search us, that we can be transformed, that we can be changed into the likeness of Christ. I pray that this morning that the seeds of your word would not fall on rocky soil, that it would not fall among the thorns, but that it would fall on good soil so that we would bear much fruit and give glory to your son, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray, amen. As a church, our mission is to pervade the back mountain, the Wyoming Valley, and the world with the gospel by making disciples who make disciples and who display the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ in every phase of our lives, and we seek to accomplish that mission by being a worshiping, growing, and serving body of believers. That is our vision as a church. Our vision is that each person within our fellowship, each person in the church, is engaged in all three aspects of worshiping, growing, and serving. Because that is essential to accomplishing our mission. And today we're going to focus on the serving aspect. To be a serving church means that we will seek to serve Christ's church, to serve the community in which we exist, and to serve the world for the glory of God. And if we are doing this collectively as individuals using the gifts, talents, skills, abilities that God has given us, it will be evident that the mission of the church is being accomplished because we will see lives transformed. And as we focus on the serving aspect today, we will do so with the intention to understand why serving is so crucial to our transformation into Christ-likeness. We'll do this by looking at biblical servanthood. We are going to look at the model of servanthood. We are going to look at our motivation to serve. And we are going to look at the mission that we accomplish through serving. So we'll get into the text, John chapter 13 is our text for this morning. And here in this chapter, we find Jesus with his 12 disciples on the eve of his crucifixion. They are in the upper room, and this is the room that Jesus had instructed Peter and John to go and prepare for them back in Luke chapter 22. He told them to go into his city, find a man carrying a jar of water, and he would take them to a house that had a fully furnished guest room for them to use for the Passover meal. So Peter and John, they find this man, and they go and they take care of 
preparing everything for the meal. They have the, the bitter herbs, the fruit and nut paste, and of course the unleavened bread and the wine all prepared for the meal. The room itself was fully furnished. It had a table, it had linens, it had floor cushions so that you could sit around the table. And of course, any fully furnished home uh, and any hospitable host of a home would have provided the pitcher and the basin and the towel for foot wash washing. Because this was the first duty of the host of a home, was to provide everything that is needed for washing of feet. The washing of feet was a, an everyday task in their culture. In fact, foot washing accounts are found going all the way back to Genesis. This is a very common routine thing that people were doing in those days. It was common because the, the mode of transportation for them was walking. They walked miles every day. And they did not have paved roads. They had very dirty, dusty roads. And they were walking with open-toed sandals. So their feet were getting very dirty. So frequent foot washing was necessary for people in this culture. Washing of feet was also considered to be a menial task. It was reserved for the lowest slave because feet were considered to be the dirtiest part of the body. And if you went into a home where the host did not have a slave to wash your feet, then guests were expected to wash their own feet. And it was also customary to wash feet before meals. So before they could proceed here in John 13 with the Passover meal, this needs to be done. The feet need to be washed. So obviously the disciples yet have not washed their feet. Maybe they were hoping because they're having dinner with the master, the Passover meal with the teacher, that someone would be there to wash their feet. And Jewish laws and traditions would have forbid that the teacher would expect or ask his disciples to wash feet. But I'm sure that probably any one of the disciples would have had no problem. They would have gladly washed the teacher's feet. But the problem is, if they were to wash his feet, then they'd have to wash everybody else's feet. And they may have thought that they were above this menial task. None of them would want to be seen as inferior to the rest. It was only a short time earlier before they arrived in Jerusalem that James and John were asking to sit at the right and left hand of Christ when he came into his glory. And it's only shortly after the Passover meal that there'd be a dispute among the disciples over who was the greatest. They were competitors for the top disciple position. There was no way that they were going to wash feet. So no one's feet are getting washed. And then the teacher, rather than rebuke them for their pride, he takes humble initiative. At this critical moment in his ministry, on the evening before his torture on the cross, before he faces the terror of standing in the place of guilty sinners, Jesus doesn't think of himself. He thinks about the needs of his disciples. And so he rose from the table, from the place of comfort. He removed his outer garments. He took a towel larger than this towel. He took a towel that he could wrap around himself. He poured water into a basin, ready to clean. And he stooped down and he demonstrated for his disciples the image of servanthood and loving leadership as he washed their feet. Why does he do this? He tells us in verse 15, if I then your Lord and teacher have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you should also do just as I have done to you. Christ took the initiative to actively serve his disciples to give them an example and this is really one of the greatest examples of servanthood in Scripture. Again, it was customary for the lowest servant to wash feet, especially for a meal as formal as Passover. So this is a, a very awkward thing that Jesus is doing, not just because of his, his relationship with the disciples as their teacher, but their feet were really dirty. And 
they're sitting at a table that's about as high as a coffee table. It's a table known as a triclinium. It's a U-shaped table, about as low as a coffee table. And remember, they're not sitting in chairs. They're sitting on the floor. They're reclining. They're leaning on the floor. So their feet are probably tucked behind them. So that should give you an image as to, to how low Jesus is really stooping to wash their feet. And he tells them that he does this to give them an example. And it's not just the action of serving that he's giving them an example of, but it's the attitude. It's the attitude of humility. The biblical model for servanthood is one of humility. Jesus had hours left. This is his last moment with all 12 disciples. And one of the last things that he does is serve them. He doesn't do a miracle. He doesn't give them a theological discourse. But a humble example of service to teach them and to teach us how we are to demonstrate love for one another and obedience to the Father. Jesus washes their feet. He had the authority of God. He is God in the flesh, but he is not concerned with his dignity. He's doing the work of a literal slave. And Philippians 2 tells us that he did not consider equality with God a thing to be grasped, but he emptied himself, taking on the form of a, a servant, and he humbled himself, putting the needs of others ahead of his own. In this passage, Philippians 2 tells us that we are to do the same thing because of the example that he set for us. He's about to be betrayed by one of his disciples. He's about to be abandoned by his disciples, forsaken by all of them. And he knows this. He knows that they are going to abandon him. And yet he washes their feet. The feet that would flee from him. The heel that would be raised up against him and would lead the soldiers to arrest him. He washed those feet. He knew all of this was about to happen, and yet he still served them. He didn't demonstrate a concern about anything else, and he forsook all comfort and status to glorify God in the present moment by serving. And if he is to be our example, what does that say about our perspectives on serving? What does that say about our prerogatives? When we say things and we think, I'd like to get involved in serving in the church, but I just have a lot of things going on, things that are, are more important to me right now. Now, as a church, let me say, as a church, we'll do whatever we can to help make serving work for you. And we have leaders that are willing to adapt to your schedules and whatever it is that you have going on, because we know that things happen in life, and we all have things going on in life. And we want to help you find roles that work with your life roles that are a good fit for you. But let me say also that serving is not about convenience. It's not something that we squeeze into our busy schedules if we can. It's not something that we give a lesser priority to because we, we see it as less valuable. Because serving is about putting someone else's needs ahead of our own. And maybe some of us have served in the past, but we've been burned or we felt unappreciated, or maybe some of us have never taken a step towards serving because we've heard stories of those who have been burned or those who have felt unappreciated, so we don't serve. And as a church, we want to give you positive experiences in serving. We don't want you to get burned or burned out. Through our mobilization process, we are very intentional about helping to place each person in a ministry role that is the best fit for their gifts, for their talents, for their skills, and for their abilities. Because we believe that if you are serving in the kind of ministry that God has designed you for, that you will experience joy in serving. And that is what we want because that is what God wants. We also take many opportunities to show appreciation for those who serve in the church. Somebody say amen to that. 
we don't want you to go unnoticed or to feel that we don't value your time and your commitment to Christ and his church. But when you think about what Christ has done for, done for us and what has happened here in light of what was to come, was he unappreciated? Did he get burned? He knew what was to come in less than 24 hours, and yet he still washed 24 feet. It is no mistake that one of his final teachings before the cross is a teaching on servanthood, not illustrated by a parable, but through a very practical, very personal act of service. The example that we have in Christ is one of humble, self-sacrificial service. Serving means that we don't put ourselves first. We do what we can through serving to enhance someone else's experience with Christ. And if we want to look like Christ, if we want to be transformed into his image, then he is the example that we need to follow. He gave us this example because it is his expectation that his disciples would do the same for one another. He says, if I then your Lord and teacher have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you also should do as I have done to you. Truly, truly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Christ expects that his disciples, that all who call him Lord, will follow the example of humble servanthood that he has set for us. And the word ought that is used here, it's, it's a word that has taken a connotation in our culture that would convey the idea of a suggestion. Hey, you know what you ought to do? You ought to go see this guy down on the avenue. He'll take care of that right away. Yeah, maybe I'll do that. Hey, we ought to go check out that uh, coffee place over there. Maybe later on. Yeah, I'll see if we can schedule it. But the true meaning of this word, ought, carries one of obligation or an expectation. Even the Greek word that is used here in verse 14 means to owe something, to be under an obligation, or to be indebted to someone or something. And as followers of Christ, we are indebted to him. We owe our lives to him. We owe it to him to serve, to serve his church and to serve those who are made in his image, to be willing to lay down our lives for others because our lives belong to him. And if he set aside his status, his comforts, his needs to serve others, then so must we. And if he, our Lord and teacher, washed the feet of his disciples, then we must put that lesson into practice. If a servant is not greater than his master, and the master humbled himself to serve, taking on the form of a servant, then the servant or servants should not take and cannot take a more esteemed position. We serve Jesus, who is our master, by serving others. Now, the expectation, of course, is not for us to literally wash one another's feet. So for those of you for the last 20 minutes who have been anxiously wondering if I'm going to ask you all to take off your shoes, you can relax. I'm not going to do that. Pastor Carl, would you mind coming up at this time to ask everyone to remove their shoes? (laughs) Practically speaking, for us, it would be challenging to adhere to a literal expectation to wash one another's feet. Our feet are usually covered, We're rarely traveling on a dusty road. We also have the luxury of indoor plumbing, baths, showers. Our standards for hygiene and cleanliness are different. So the act of washing one another's feet would have almost no value for us. But it's the principle, it's the purpose of the example that Christ gives us here that we must focus on. He washes their feet to teach them and to teach us that his expectation as our Lord and Master 
is that we would have the attitude of humility, that we would be ready and willing to serve one another in a way that denies self, in a way that places the needs and interests of others ahead of our own. We are indebted to the Lord. We owe our lives to him, and he is calling us to personal humility. He is calling us to loving service. And we know that loving service is an expectation of Christ, so much so that he gives his disciples, here in John chapter 13, a new commandment. He says, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples, if you have a love for one another. Love one another as I have loved you. How did he love? How did he love his disciples? How did he love us? By taking on the form of a servant on our behalf. By humbling himself to the point of death, even death on a cross, he washed their feet. He laid down his life. The love of God was shown in these humble acts of obedience for our benefit. Because we have this command to love one another as he has loved us. Because we are indebted to Christ. We are called to love the Lord our God with everything that we have. Love must be our motivation to serve. God so loved the world that he gave his only son. Love must be our motivation to give of ourselves for the benefit of others. Serving one another with humility proves our love. It proves our love for one another and it proves our love for God. Love was and is the main motivation for Christ and it should be for us. This is his heart. His intention is to make us like himself. So he says, what I do, you must also do. If you want to know Jesus and understand his heart for sinners, this is how you do it. And we see in scripture how Christ, our example of biblical servanthood, is motivated by a love for others and a love for God. And his ministry of servanthood proved this. Look back at verse 1. John sets up this entire chapter by framing it around Jesus' love for his disciples. It says, Now that before the feast of Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart out of this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. They are about to forsake him completely. Yet he loved them to the end. What that means is that he continued to prove his love to them, to give them clear evidence that he loved them. And we see that demonstrated in the washing of feet, and we see that demonstrated on the cross. And because he is our example, the love for God and for all those who are made in his image should be our primary motivation for serving. He is calling us to prove our love. And he says that the proof of our love is found in our discipleship. Our love is the proof that we are his disciples. How do we demonstrate love to prove that we are his? Serve. Ephesians 5 tells us this. Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children and walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. As Christ, our example, served us, setting aside his comforts out of love, we are to be imitators. We are to imitate him, to serve one another in the same way, with the same motivation, Love. Love is foundational to Christian service. 
1 Corinthians 13 tells us that we cannot truly do God's work in a way that pleases him, in a way that has any kind of eternal value if it is done without love. Love is what gives life to service. The ministries of this church must be motivated by love. And we see in that passage, Ephesians 5, that his love for the Father ultimately is what motivated him to lay down his life. And Christ confirms this to his disciples as well, back in the book of John in chapter 14. He says, I do as my Father has commanded me, so that the world may know that I love the Father. He took on the form of a servant and obeyed the Father completely to prove his love for the Father. He is our example. If we, like him, allow the love of God and the love for those made in his image to be our motivation for serving, then it will be evident to others. And what will be the outcome? What will be the result of serving in that way? Disciples will be made. Disciples who glorify him. And that brings us to the mission of biblical servanthood. All followers of Christ, no matter your gifts, your talents, your skills, your age, your race, your social status, we all have the same command and the same purpose in serving Christ. All servants of Christ have been commissioned by Christ to go therefore and to make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that he has commanded us. If we follow his model of service and we're motivated by our love for God and love for others, then making disciples will happen. We will see more people coming to Christ and we will see those who follow him being transformed more fully into his image. And that is why serving is essential. And that is why serving is part of our mission and vision as a church. And why we believe that if we are a serving church that we will accomplish the mission that God has given us. Serving God will result in disciples being made. Christ modeled servanthood before his disciples to teach them what it means to serve and then he told them to do it. And then he told them to do it. Disciples are made. Disciples are transformed in his image as they are taught as he commanded them. Serving makes disciples. Now look again at our mission statement. Notice how this mission statement reflects the words of the Great Commission. That is deliberate. We are called to serve to accomplish what Christ calls us to in the Great Commission. And the mission statement for this church is how we have adapted the Great Commission to fit within the context of our time and location that God has placed us in. And if you're part of this church, if you've, if you've been a member for a couple of minutes or for a couple of decades, or if you're a regular attender, you've been here for, for a few months or even a few years, if you consider Fellowship Church to be your church, if you say that you're a part of Fellowship Church, if you say, this is my church, what you are saying, whether or not you realize it, what you are saying in that statement is that you have made a choice to align yourself with this mission. By calling this your church home, you are committing to being part of what God is calling us to do in this community and in this world. And if you call this your church home, if you are part of Fellowship Church, then we believe that God has placed you here for the purpose of helping to pervade this community in the world with the gospels and to make disciples for his glory. He calls us to make disciples and to teach them as he has commanded, serving selflessly with humility out of a love for God and a love for others is one of those things that he has commanded us to do. This is how we make disciples, by serving. He wants to use you, your gifts, your talents, your skills, your abilities to make disciples. Scripture says that when each one of us 
uses our gifts to serve him, then the church will be built up. Disciples will be made. He wants you to follow Christ's example of service before others so that they can know Christ more fully. And your pastors want to give you opportunities to do that. We want to give you opportunities to serve and to make disciples so that the church can be built up, so that each one of us can look like Jesus Christ. We want to help you serve in the way that God has called you to. So when you hear from me, Gen Z, this is a phone. When you hear from me, or when a leader of a a church ministry reaches out to you to talk about an opportunity to serve, we aren't doing that to ask you to do something that nobody else wanted to do, and we don't want to do ourselves. And we're not doing that just to fill a spot in a schedule. Now, there are spots in the schedules that need to be filled, especially in kids' ministry. <clears throat> but there are many opportunities. There are many opportunities to serve. And we want to encourage you. This is why we're doing it. This is why we, we come to you with opportunities to serve, because we want to encourage you as disciples of Christ to make more disciples, because that's what we're all called to do. We want to encourage you to fulfill what God is calling you to do. We want to give you opportunities to model Christ-like servanthood before others and to demonstrate a love of God and a love for others through acts of service so that more people would come to know Christ through your serving. We want you to be all that God has designed you to be, to fulfill our vision of being a serving church to accomplish this mission. We also want to see you each one of you, display his glory. That is what we ultimately seek to accomplish through our mission. And the way that each one of us displays the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ in every phase of our lives is by being conformed to his character. This happens when we follow his example of servanthood. Near the conclusion of the meal, after all the feet had been washed and the bread was broken and dipped and Judas left to betray him. Jesus said, Now is the Son of Man glorified, and God is glorified in him. If God is glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself and glorify him at once. The time for which he was born was here. The time for which he came to humble himself and take on the form of a servant was here. The time to suffer was here. And yet Jesus saw the cross as a means to glorify God. He despised the shame because of the joy that was set before him. This is how we should see serving him. Forsaking our comforts to serve our Lord and Savior. Serving as a way to glorify him. Parking cars in single digit temperatures. Leaving the comfortable seats in the worship center to go play on the floor of the nursery. Standing in a room in front of a hundred people to sing and use your gifts to worship the Lord. It's not always going to be comfortable But we're not called to focus on the discomforts of serving. We're called to accomplish a mission for the glory of God. Jesus Christ is who we want to be like. That is our purpose as his followers. And as one of your pastors, I want to see each person in this church transformed into his image. And every one of our pastors would say the same thing. We want to see you look like Jesus. When you put on his character, you display his glory. Jesus Christ denied himself and took on the form of a servant to glorify God. We should see serving the same way. If we desire to fulfill the mission of this church, which ultimately is to glorify the Lord Jesus Christ in every phase of our lives, one of the ways that we will do that is by making less of ourselves and making more of him 
through serving one another. We will exemplify what he has called us to when we serve him. And when we do that by serving others with love and by serving the church that he gave himself up for, we will glorify him. Serving is not about what the church leadership, the pastors, the elders, or anyone else on earth expects you to do. You're not obligated to any master other than the Lord Jesus Christ. Each one of us is a servant indebted to him, to the one to whom we owe our lives. We serve by his example. Jesus expects you to do that. He expects you to follow his example. He desires to see you serve and to serve out of love because he first loved you. So that people would have opportunities to hear the gospel. And so that more disciples would be made who would be united with him in his glory. And that is why Fellowship Church exists. For God's glory. As you leave today, we have some of these available for you in the back. We want you to take one of these towels as a reminder, as a tangible reminder. Towels are meant for a menial task. It's the tool of servanthood. But take one as you leave today and use it. But when you use it, be reminded of the call of a servant. Remember the model of serving that Jesus Christ gives us to follow. Be encouraged as you use it to let your love for God and your love for others motivate you to serve. And when you use it, let it prompt you to pray for the mission that we are seeking to accomplish. God desires to use you to accomplish the mission to make disciples for his glory. Pray for opportunities as you use this towel. Pray for opportunities that God would give you to serve, to fulfill the vision of this church for his glory. Let's pray. God, we thank you for your son, Jesus Christ, who took on the form of a servant, the son of God, Yet he did not consider equality with God a thing to be grasped, but he emptied himself. He forsook all comforts. He forsook the glories of heaven to take on the form of a servant. Why? For us. So that we could know him. So that we could have reconciliation with you. And now you have called us as your people, as the body of Christ, to go and do the same. To do as he has done. To take on so that more people would be able to experience the love of God that they would know that God loves them so much that he sent his son to die for them. That disciples would be made who display your image, who display your glory in every phase of their lives. And we pray that for each person that is here this morning, God. We thank you for your word. Let it change us. In Christ's name, amen. Just think about the beauty of the church, not just here, but all around the world, every culture, all around the world, people called to know and to be disciples of Christ and serving him for his glory, him displaying his glory through all of those people um, from every possible walk of life imaginable. That's a, that's a beautiful thought. That's, let's let this song be a prayer that we would be uh, submitted to glorifying God in every aspect of who we are, that we would display his glory, uh, that he would be magnified in us, glorified in us. Lord God, we do want to make much of who you are. 
We want our lives to be, Lord, all about you. That as we serve in your name, it would bring glory to you. We display the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ in every life, in every aspect of our life, Lord. We pray this prayer together for you. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand together.
God, that is our prayer. That Christ would be magnified in each one of us. As a church, you have called us to go into this community, to share your truth, to share the gospel, to make disciples, and to display your glory. To magnify Christ with our lives. So no matter how you've called us to serve, each one of us, God, has been designed by you. Each one of us is unique and has been giving, given specific things, specific tasks, specific ways that we can serve you and help us to see that each one of those things, no matter how small, has value because our purpose is found in Jesus Christ and our lives belong to him. Go before us today and allow us by your spirit to use our lives for your glory. In Christ's name I pray, amen. Thank you.